Thank you, Jesus. Pray with me this morning. Father, we come before you today, and we do thank you for saving our soul, for going to the cross and shedding your blood, God, that we might have eternal life. God, that we might have our sins, though they be many, be cleansed, washed white as snow. We honor you in this place today, Lord, with our hearts, with our worship. God, we just want you to know today how much we glorify you, appreciate you, are thankful for you above all things. In Jesus' name, Lord, as we turn our attention to the pages of your word, we ask, God, that you might illuminate it. God, that you might enable us to hear what you're speaking to us, not only as a church, but as individuals. That we might take your word, humbly apply it, and that you might produce your fruit in us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you, worship team. Give them a hand. They did a great job this morning, as usual. Man, they always do a great job. The Word of God is like a seed, according to the Bible. And you know very well, if you're going to plant a garden, if you're going to plant seeds in your garden, you've got to till the ground up first. Amen? You don't just put seed on hard ground. You've got to till it up first. And that's what worship does for us. It kind of tills up the ground of our heart. We have a tendency sometimes to come in a little hard-hearted, maybe a little distracted, uh, things bothering us. And there's something about, as we talked about last week, uh, worshiping God, praising God when it matters the most, lifting our hands toward Him, singing that, that joyful noise, uh, forgetting about our, laying aside our problems for just a little bit and worshiping God anyway. Um, it prepares our heart, get us ready for what God wants to say to us this morning. So I'm confident uh, in this word that God has given me for you today. I pray that I'll be able to um, get it out the way that uh, he's placed it in my heart. But for the most part, it's up to you. Amen. I'll do my part. I'll do what I can to, to say it. Although I will say this, I wasn't nervous until Steve asked God to make this my best sermon ever. Uh, <laughs> now I'm a little nervous. So it's like a little pressure, a little pressure here. Uh, so um, I'll do my best, but it's, it's, ultimately, it's ultimately up to how we receive the message, amen? I have, believe me, I have botched a mini sermon um, only to have somebody say, man, that's just what I needed to hear. Uh, I think God does that once in a while just to keep me humble, but it makes me know it's not about me, it's not about the delivery, amen? It, it's about the condition of our, the willingness to receive in our heart. Um, the word that God has laid on our hearts. So we're going to jump into it this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to just read, excuse me, I'm going to read verse 19. Just kind of established our text here today. And then we'll kind of come back and talk about some of the verses leading up to verse 19. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19. I'll mostly be reading from the ESV today, but this one's actually quoted from the King James. It says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that's what I titled my message this morning, Men Most Miserable. Let me, and now obviously you probably know this, but just so you do, so that in case you don't know, you'll know. Uh, you know, when the scripture refers, especially in King James and things of that nature, when it's talking about, when it says men, it's speaking of mankind, right? Everybody. This is not a verse that just applies to the male gender. It's speaking to all men, mankind. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So let me, let me read it to you another way. The most miserable people on earth are the ones that live only for this life and make no preparations for the life after death. Amen? That's basically what that verse is just saying. Who's miserable? The people that only have this life to look forward to. Now, if you go back, and I'm not going to read all of this, but if you go back in 1 Corinthians, uh, a few verses leading up to that, which, what leads up to Paul saying this very thing was he's writing a letter to the church at Corinth. This was a, a church that Paul had established, right, uh, in a city called Corinth. He's writing a letter to them, and turns out it seems that somebody within the church was basically teaching or trying to stir this teaching that once you die you just die and it's over. There's no resurrection, which is odd because they would say you, you need to believe in Jesus in order to be saved, but once you die, you cease to exist. There's no resurrection. And so Paul is basically writing this letter saying, mm, what would be the point, right? If there's no resurrection, if we don't live again after we die, then what's the point in accepting Christ, right? All of that is vain uh, and there really wouldn't be any, any point in it. Um, he said, of course there's a resurrection of the dead. Jesus proved that. Because he goes to say, ultimately, that if, if, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, 
then we're all in a world of trouble, right? That's a paraphrase, but that's basically what he's saying. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then none of us are going to. The last part of that verse, I think it's in, I think verse 20, says, um, he goes on to say, brothers, do not be children. Um, no, that's not it. Where's that? 15, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong verse. Here we go. Verse 20, he says, if it, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have been fallen asleep. Whenever you talk about something being the first fruits, it means it's, if something's the first, doesn't that automatically imply that there's going to be more to follow? Right? Because you, otherwise you would say only. Jesus is the only, and Jesus up until this point in, in time, all of mankind, nobody has ever risen from the dead and stayed alive. Okay, there's been instances we read about in scripture where somebody died and came back to life, like Lazarus, right? I think some guy they threw onto, uh, was it Elijah's bones that came back to life? Uh, J. Iris' daughter, Jesus raised from the dead, but they all died again. Okay, so there's been some that rose from the dead in some miraculous way, but nobody has ever risen from the dead and stayed alive except for Jesus Christ, in a glorified body where he's seated at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for us, who will return in glory, right? He's been resurrected and will always live. He's eternal. He will never die. And so Paul's saying Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, which means everybody after him who follows him will also resurrect and live forever. It's the hope that we have as Christians, right? It's what, and so he's guaranteeing us that. So he's saying, if, if all we had to look forward to was this life, what a miserable existence it would be. Amen? And why bother serving Jesus if we're just, I mean, live it up. That's ultimately what he's saying. If there's no resurrection, we're just going to fizzle out at the end and then live it up. That's not the way, that's not the way that it works. He goes on to talk about, if you read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, where he's talking about, you know, our glorified body and how, you know, great it's going to be and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to get into all that other than to say this, that when we think about the death, when we think about uh, the resurrection, the reason God gave us, I'm going to call it, it's going to sound funny, but I'm going to call it the gift of death, okay? We don't think about death being a gift. We think about it being a bad thing, and I get that. We, we lose loved ones. But death is a gift that God gave us because what death does is it keeps us from being trapped in this miserable world for eternity, Think about that for just a minute. You know, in, in, in the beginning in Genesis, when Adam and Eve first sinned against God, and God kicked them out of the garden, the Bible says that he put a, an angel with a flaming sword at the gate of Eden so that they, they and no mankind could ever get back into the garden of Eden. They lost paradise, right? I mean, we can't even fathom what Eden, the garden of Eden would have been like. Uh, and they lost all of that. And so we get a picture in our mind of this angry, you know, God kicking him out, he's mad at him, and this angry angel with a sword to keep him out and all of that kind of stuff. But in reality, God put that angel there as an act of mercy. Because here's what God said. In their current sinful condition, I don't want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever. Can you imagine? I get it. We think about death and we dread it. We're, we're, we're born. God created us with a will to live. But I don't want to live in this world forever. Amen. Amen. It's horrible. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of blessings we're going to get on both sides of the spectrum. I would not want to be trapped in this world the way it is for all eternity. So God gave us that gift of death to get out of it because God says hey, they'll be miserable. I'll, I'll let them be miserable for a little while and kind of sleep in the bed they made, Right? Because the world, the reason the world's so yucky is because we made it that way as human beings. It's our sin that made the world the way that it is. And so for a period of time, in our lifetime, we deal with the misery that comes along in death. But the hope that we have as God's people, what keeps us from just being in complete despair, is the hope in knowing that one day I will die, this life will be over, and I will live again to be with Jesus for all eternity. Amen. That's the hope we have. So have you noticed in this day and age, have you noticed that people seem to be more miserable these days? Why is that? Because their hope is in this life only, right? This life is full of natural disaster, you know, wildfires, earthquakes, volcanoes, disease, uh, hurricanes, you know, you name it. Just natural disasters in and of itself create so much pain. There's political corruption, on, on both sides, right? The crumbling economy, uh, rising crime. Crime's getting worse. All, am, I, am I cheering you up yet? Yeah. 
crime worse than it's ever been. We see looting and riots and all these things we're, you know, in our society that we live in uh, is odd. It's upside down because criminals are kind of made out to be the victims these days. You know, they go out and they loot and they do all this damage and steal from people and they're made out to be the victim and, and the good, hardworking person who pays their bills and worked for everything they've got are kind of made out to be, um, you know, selfish tyrants. And so the world's just upside down. We got war, um, you know, all over the globe and in different places. So if that's all, if this world is all I have to look forward to with all of that going on, that would make a man most miserable, would it not? High profile, high profile atheists, you know, you can't hardly, your kids can't hardly go to university without coming in contact with one or many or multiple or all um, professors, atheists, professors, atheism, high profile atheism, whether it's, uh, you know, in the universities or whether it's, you know, uh, um, celebrities or, or whatever that are convincing people that God doesn't exist, right? There's, there's no God and therefore there's no afterlife. You, you want to know why despair and depression and, and people are just more miserable all the time? As, as time goes on, people are increasingly miserable? Well, of course. They're being fed this lie that God doesn't exist and nor does the afterlife. This is all you got. That, that's ultimately what the atheists preach. This is all there is. Oh, good Lord, that's not much. That makes me miserable to think if this is all I've got, of course, of course people are, are miserable. See, when there's no God to answer to, then anything goes. And when, in other words, there's not a right or wrong, anything goes, other than just what people decide is right or wrong. And, and I mean, that spectrum's wide open. When God doesn't exist, we get him out of the way, anything goes. And when anything goes, then people resort back to their animal-like, if you will, nature. Right, which is pretty much just do whatever you want to, whatever you got to do to get what you want, do it. That's that's the nature of the world that we live in. You live for you. You're only on Earth for a little period of time. Do whatever you got to do to get whatever you want. And when people live that way as a whole, it makes people miserable. Right? Jesus said says this in Matthew. He says. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Because sin and iniquity and wrongdoing grows, people's love for one another decreases, gets cold. Well, it, it becomes this vicious trap, because, or this vicious cycle, because as, as people's love grows cold, then iniquity grows. As iniquity grows, people's love for one another grows. And it just becomes this vicious cycle where you, the only, it's a recipe for a really yucky world, right? Jesus said this, sin... People will live for this world and their love for one another will just, will just grow cold and it'll only get worse. Have, have, I, have I encouraged you yet? Are you, are you good and down? I'm going to lift you back up, okay? Take the ride with me here. So does that mean that, it's that people are only miserable if they don't get what they want? In life, I mean, we've just designated basically, if in this life I have a, so in other words, if in order to be happy, I have to make X amount of dollars, I have to get to this certain social status, and that's what's going to really fulfill me. Well, what if I never get to that? A lot of people don't. And, and I'm miserable because that's all I have to, to achieve because there's no, there's no life after death. So that's my goal, and if I don't hit my goal, I'm miserable. So what about the people who hit their goal? I mean, they can't be miserable, right? What about the people who who accomplished everything they've ever wanted to accomplish in life, who, who have a, attained great riches and wealth and pa fame and popularity, those people can't be miserable, right? They're all happy. No, they're, still miserable. they're still miserable. Why? Because this is all they have to look forward to. If in this life only you have hope, we're all men most miserable. So people that have everything they want, so why, why, would they be, why would they be miserable as well? Because deep down they know that once they die... All of those things are of no use to them. Deep down they know that. If I'm, a, if I'm an atheist person, and I'm just filthy rich, and I have this belief, this core belief that once I die it's over, then I, I would have to think to myself, well, what's the point? Right? What's the point? You know, the scripture even says, you know, what, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Right? What amount of money would be worth giving up your soul for? Well, these people know deep down it's temporary. If I, when I die, it's all over. Well, who really cares? And they're miserable. All of earth's blessings, 
are temporary and cannot, are impossible, are, are incapable of producing permanent happiness. Right? Impossible. Think about all the good things now in life that, that make us happy. Family, family can die. Well, I'm just a bundle of joy this morning, aren't I? So family, family is what really fulfills me and makes me happy. Well, your family can die. So I got good health. Well, uh, health can, can lose out to sickness, right? You can be healthy one day and find out you, you've got a, a sickness that will wipe out your health. Health is temporary. The job, jobs are fulfilling. Jobs are good. Um, you know, we make a, a living and we achieve goals. And, and all these things are good, by the way. Good things to, to have goals. And, uh, and this is not, by the way, let me say this. This is not a sermon against money. I wish I had a truckload of it. I wish every one of you had a truckload of it. The point is, if that money becomes our, if, if, if things, money that we attain, riches that we attain in this life become what we pursue, then it becomes an idol to us and it, be, and it, and it separates our heart from God. So not there's anything wrong, wrong with money. So jobs, you say, you know, job, that makes me, that makes me happy, making, making money. Well, jobs can be lost, right? Economies have crashed before. Houses can burn. Cars can be wrecked. That's my wife. So, it wasn't her fault. It wasn't her fault. But, so, let me, let me use that as an example while we're on the subject. Tina has always, she always wanted a fifth generation Camaro. Always wanted. I mean, ever since they came out. Oh, I love those cars. I want one of those. Every time we see one on the road. Oh, I want one of those. We see one on TV. I want one of those. Always wanting a fifth generation Camaro. So, when our kids got old enough where we didn't have to towed them around, they could drive themselves, and they paid their own bills and all that kind of stuff. She said, I'm trading in my Tahoe for a fifth generation Camaro. So she did. She loved that car. Just what she wanted. Until, had stick shift, everything she, and to everything she wanted. One lowly deer <laughs> took her treasure away. Yeah. <laughs> One deer. One normal day on her way to work. Deer jumps out, it, looked, it just wadded it up like tinfoil, right? Shoved it all, totaled it. Her treasure taken away like that. So she was disappointed, obviously. You know, it was her car and stuff. But she, did, she didn't just like lose the will to live. You know why? Because she liked, she liked the car, but that's not what she lives for, right? Take, take all of it away. You have to stop. Where, where's your, Jesus goes on to say, you know, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And you, you can gauge that. I mean, you can, you can kind of test yourself. Where is your, where is your true treasure? We you ask yourself this question. If everything else was taken away and that's all I had, would I be happy? So if she lost her children, her home, and her job, and everything, but she still had her Camaro, would she be happy? No, it's not capable of providing that kind of happiness. But, so you have to ask yourself, if, so that's why Jesus says he, he wants to be eternal things. He wants to be our treasure. Because here's the, here's the truth of the matter. You take everything else away, family, riches, wealth, you take it all away, and all you have left is Jesus. Folks, you can still be happy. You can still be fulfilled. You can still be satisfied in your heart because it's not something that anybody can ever take away from you. It's permanent. That's the treasure that exists beyond the grave. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy it. Go buy yourself a brand new truck right off the line. One of these days it'll be a rust bucket. Where thieves break in and steal, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Your faith in Christ, that which you have in eternity is something nobody can ever take away. Even if they take your life. Isn't that something? Even if somebody kills you and takes your very life, they can't take away your relationship with God and your eternal reward cannot be taken away. It's not about stuff. It's not about things. I'll tell you what, uh, hang a left there and go back to about Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And I do, I do want to read this because this is a perfect example. Solomon was like the poster child for miserable rich people. Okay? Um, and we're going to see this. I want to read about 11 verses, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. Now, if you don't know about Solomon, just a heads up here. Solomon started out good, okay, as a young man. When he first, as a young man, took over as king, he, he, his heart was in the right place. He said, Lord, I, uh, God basically come to Solomon and said, I'm giving you a blank check. 
You ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon could have asked for wealth. He could have asked for power. So many things he could have asked for. Could have asked for more wishes, you know, right? But he, what he asked for was this. One thing, he said, God, what I'm asking you is that you give me wisdom. Wisdom to lead your people. That was the one thing he asked for. And God, God was so enjoyed by this request that he gave him the wisdom he asked for and he gave him what he didn't ask for. He gave him wealth. He gave him power. He gave him all of those things. And so Solomon, it, the scripture speaks of Solomon in that he was the wisest man to have ever lived. So much wisdom he had. Started off good. But he lost sight of what really mattered. Right? He lost sight of the eternal treasures. And Solomon began to get his focus more on temporary things. Earthly women, earthly gods, earthly funds. Took his eyes completely off God and the man, though he had everything, became a man most miserable. And as we, as we read this, you'll see as it comes out here. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. Solomon writing, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself, Solomon. Live it up. But behold, this is this was also vanity. What is vanity? It means it's meaningless, worthless, pointless. All of it was vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? You know, something, I see something that's funny and it, it gives me pleasure. And I think, well, what was the purpose? I laughed for a second and now I'm miserable again. The greatest of comedians did him no good. I, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. I tried alcohol. I just tried to get drunk, thinking maybe that would kind of give me some pleasure. That wore off. How to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female servants, had slaves who were born in my house. I, I had also great possessions of herds and flocks. More than anyone who had been before me in Jerusalem. Richer than anybody had ever been. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines. The delight of the sons of man. I think, I think, I think if I remember correctly, Scripture Solomon had like, it was either 300 wives and 700 concubines or vice versa. 700 wives and 300 concubines, I forget. Well, he, but he had 1,000 women, Right? didn't do it for him. Uh, I, I, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. What, look here, this, here's the key. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my ro reward for all my toil. He literally is saying, anything I wanted, I got it. I held nothing back from myself. Most people would say, boy, I bet that guy was happy. He had no financial struggles. Everybody liked him. Everywhere he went, it was a party. Everybody always patting him on the back. This guy had it made. But he says in verse 11, Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. Behold, all was vanity. Useless, meaningless, pointless, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. It was all pointless. He was a man most miserable, though he had everything. Why? Because everything he had was temporary. He had forgotten about the eternal. He said, this is my reward. Think about that. Jesus talked about that a little bit. They will have, don't worry about that, they will have their reward, people who you know, pray for everybody's recognition, you know, or whatever. He said, if, if your reward, if, if riches is what you really are pursuing and you get that in life, then you're getting your reward early, so to speak. If fame and popularity and anything, anything having to do with this world, this temporary world, is your goal and you get it, then you got your reward early. But then when you stand before God, there's no reward, right? Get your reward now and miss heaven later. Or maybe have to go without your reward now and get heaven later. Where's the reward? What matters most is that which takes place literally after we die. How many times we, we see on the news all the time about rich, wealthy people 
famous people who have committed suicide, right? It, the, the money, the fame, fortune, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough for them. Um, turn with me into Luke chapter 16. Look, I, I get it. This is a little heavy. I can think of nothing more important for people to keep in their mind regularly than this word right here. Amen? You cannot take it with you. You've heard that saying before? So true. Everybody wants to be happy, but everybody has a tendency to look at it in the wrong place. So in this scripture here, Luke chapter 16, um, Jesus tells a, a story here, uh, kind of a contrast to two different types, two people who live very much two different types of lives. Okay? One poor, one rich, and they both died. You know rich people die exactly the same way as poor people? I mean, everybody dies exactly the same. And this is what, this is what Jesus says. I'm going to read this. I want you to grab a hold of this today. There was a rich man who was clothed in, fine, in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. In other words, he had everything the world could offer him. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, different Lazarus than the one Jesus raised from the dead. He was covered with sores. He had disease. He desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. He was poor. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores, had no friends, only dogs that would associate with him. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades or in hell. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Two very different lives, two very different goals, two very, but they all, they had one thing in common, they died exactly the same way. Amen? Their heart stopped beating. Their lungs stopped filling with air. They died exactly the same. And they did this number. Whew. Literally. There's only, I'd like to be able to stand up here today and tell you that there's all kinds of options for us. You know what I mean? When you die, there's, there's 10 or 12 different options, different, 10 or 12 different places you can end up. For the really, really, really bad people, you know, there's the burning hell. For the really, really, really good people, there's a sweet spot in heaven. And then it's just all kind of, you know, there's a spectrum. If you were kind of good, but you didn't really follow the Lord, you know, doesn't work that way. Two, name them two places. Heaven, hell. And here's what is the deciding factor. Did you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's it. Not were you a good person. A lot of good people. Good people. Law-abiding citizens. Don't make it to heaven. Because they rejected Jesus Christ. Right? Heaven, hell. These are the only two options Jesus gave here. The poor man laid his treasures up in heaven. His focus was on that which is eternal. So then when he died, he went there. The rich man put, put all his eggs in one basket. And that was everything on this earth. And he ended up in hell. Would you say that he was probably miserable? We know he was. He lifted up his eyes in hell. The Bible says being in torments. Torments, plural. Not only the pain of the physical anguish of being in a lake of fire, but also realizing what he missed, right? What I could have done. He walked past this beggar day after day after day. Could have shown compassion. Didn't. Could have helped this guy. Didn't. Why? He was self-absorbed, like so many of us are. Jesus goes on to say, that he called out, the, the rich man from hell, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Too late now, right? I mean, God is full of mercy. Here's the good news that I'm working up towards. God will forgive you for any sin you've committed. Amen? Right now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, he will forgive you, no questions asked, bring you into his family, cleanse you by his blood, and write your name in heaven. There's so much mercy available. And as long as you live, there's going to be the mercy of God will be available. But the second you die, mercy's out. He said, have mercy on me. It was too late at that point. Because his treasures were all on worldly, temporary things. No, you, you got what you wanted. Riches, fame. But he said, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am anguished in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. You already got your reward. Lazarus, in like, in, in like manner, he got bad things. Now he's comforted and you are in anguish. None of this man's treasures helped him once he died. You just can't take it with you. Amen? 
Um, and I'm glad. I'm glad. There's not anything. I, I, I'm blessed in this life. I, mean, I think many of us can say we are. The only thing, folks, the only thing I want to take with me to heaven is my family and my friends. Amen? That's all that matters. That's laying up treasure in heaven. Grandkids, when I get them. Can't hint. <laughs> no, I tell you what, of all the people, of all the writings in the Bible, we, we, Paul, Paul was the one that wrote that. Very first, first we said, hey, if, if, if in this life, if this is all we have to look forward to, then we're of men most miserable. He wrote so much about this topic in, in, in all of his letters. I mean, all the churches that he established, different parts, and he would write these. That's why we have the New Testament, by the way, if you don't know that, are letters that Paul would write to these churches. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, preserved these, and that's what we have today. And, and Paul understood this concept like nobody, not like nobody ever before, uh, really, other than Jesus Christ, obviously. But here's what Paul wrote. He, he gives us a little excerpt of some of the things that, Paul, that he went through in this life. I mean, here, here's, just a, here's just a nutshell of what Paul's life was like after he became a Christian as he was a preacher of the gospel. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, five times, count them five, I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, save one. The Romans would beat somebody, tie them to the whipping post, beat them. If the, if the sentence was you get 40 lashes, they would beat them 39 times, right? They, they say that the Roman soldiers, if he was to go over, then he would have to take the whip. I don't know. I've never researched all that. But the bottom line was, 40 lashes save one. They would get 39 stripes. Five times, Paul says, I've been strapped to a whip, whipping post and beaten with a whip 39 times each time. Count the stripes. Think about that. They would use, I mean, it wasn't like an Indiana Jones whip that they used. It was The, the Romans would use a cat of nine tails, which, which literally the, this whip that had nine strands of leather with metal and bone that was woven into the leather so that when they would, every hit, and they would pull it back and it would rip flesh, literally from the rib cage in the back, nine stripes with every hit. 39 wax times nine, and that happened to him five times. I should have done the math. I didn't do the math. But that's how many stripes would have been on Paul's back. The dude's back looked like hamburger. There's no doubt. Five times, he said, I received 30, 39 stripes, or 40 st stripes, uh, less one. Three times, I was beaten with rods. It's like taking a tent rope. We talked about this in Bible study the other night. It's like, you know, like you ever put up a pup, a pup tent, right? Those big, long, wobbly rods that you put up a, a pup. That's kind of what they would beat people with. These big, long, gangly rods and <laughs> on your back. He said, that happened to me three times. Once, I was stoned. Three times, I was shipwrecked. A night in the day, I was adrift at sea, frequently on journeys, traveling everywhere, in danger, all these dangers that he, fought, that he faced, dangers in the river, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, danger from false brothers, a lot of danger he faced, and toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirsty and thirst, often with, without food, in cold and exposure. Carhartt, Carhartt hadn't been invented back then, right? He, he's in cold and he didn't have, it's not, like they, it's not like back then they provided prisoners with, you know, coveralls. He has nothing. He said, I've been exposed to the elements. Apart from all of these things, there's the daily pressure on me for, uh, and my anxiety for all of the churches. The pressure from knowing that it's my responsibility to lead people to Jesus and, and, and try to write letters to these churches to make sure that they're, they're, they're doing right. He's all, I mean, that was, that's hard. Man, that's miserable. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that would be a miserable existence? But Paul says, no. What's miserable is putting all my hope in this life. In his letter to the Romans, he says it like this. He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, a.k.a. everything I just read, the sufferings that I go through here in this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in me. How do I get through it? How do I endure all this, Paul says? It's the hope of glory. It's the hope of eternity, knowing that this is all just temporary and will go away. In, in, in his letter to the Colossians, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, talking about that resurrection we were talking about earlier, if you've been raised with Christ, not only in the little, literal resurrection, but resurrection from, from sin into the newness of life, then seek the things that are above, eternal things, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Look here. 
this is, this is good words to live by. I would encourage you to memorize this first. Let this, be, this, let this be your personal motto. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. Things that are above, things that are eternal, things that will last forever. Not something that's gonna, that, a, that a moth could corrupt or eat holes in or rust could get to or somebody could steal from you. Don't put all your, don't put all your trust in that, Paul says. No. For you've died and your life is hidden in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. It's all about the glory, the end glory. Mankind's always seeking glory. I want, I want man to pat me on the back. I want man to see how great I am. Paul says, mm, I think I'm going to defer my glory to the second half. Right? I'm going to defer my glory. I'll wait and get it later. Amen. When I'm in heaven, surrounded by God's glory. He said, I don't, I don't need man's glory. I don't need man's approval to be happy. You know what? You know what's miserable? You don't be miserable. Try to make people happy. Try to impress people. You might for a minute. I mean, think about it. You could do something, man. You take like a, a professional athlete. Man, he's on his game and he's got all kinds of stats and everybody just praises, praises his name. Man, he's living life. He's got everybody's recognition. One injury. Nobody cares anymore, right? Even if somehow you were able to impress people, only temporary. People will turn on your back in a heartbeat. First, and, and then Paul writes a letter to Timothy, and I'm winding this down. In Timothy, he writes, godliness with contentment is great, great gain. Does anybody know the word of the mean, uh, meaning of the word contentment? Because our society doesn't understand that word very much anymore, especially in our American society, okay? Because... Uh, in, in America, the last thing marketing companies want is for people to get content. What is contentment? It means I'm satisfied with what I have. I don't need more to be happy. He goes on to say, having food and raiment. I like, so for, well, first of all, he says this. We brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out. I know you've probably heard it's, it's an old joke about the guy that said, hey, when I die, when I, die I'm gonna, I want to take everything to heaven with me. So he puts all of his treasures in the attic, Right? He says, I want to take, put all my money in the attic, and then when I die, I'm going to grab it on my way. I want to take it with me. He died. His wife went up, and all of his money, his treasure is still there. And she said, I knew he should have put that in the basement, right? <laughs> whole, whole joke, bad joke. But, but honestly, honestly, truth to that, right? In, in reality, put it in the basement, put it in the attic, and I'm taking it with you, right? It's certain, Paul says, I brought nothing into this world, and I'm not going to take anything out of it. Everything I attain right here is going to stay right here. But, but if we have food and clothing, the basic necessities of life, the things that do bring joy, family and all of those types of things, with these things be content. But those things, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many selfless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I said that a minute ago. Money's not the root of all evil. I wish y'all had a truckload of it. Right? It's the love of money that becomes the root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves uh, with many plagues. Like, I think it was John that wrote, he said, I, I, I pray that you prosper even as your souls prosper. Do well in life. Hey, get a good job. Establish a nice retirement next day. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with do that. That's good. Prosper as your soul prospers. Because that's the part that matters. It's part that's, that's the part that's going to live on. If you prosper in your soul, meaning Jesus Christ is your Lord and you know you're going to go to heaven when you die, that's the only, then, then everything's good after that. You don't have to worry about anything else after that. Men most miserable can be turned into men most merry. Amen? Men most merry. Proverbs, I believe it is, says that a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. If your heart is merry, it's content, it shows in your face, it shows in your life. The blessings of God will show, amen, that blessing of contentment. There's a song that, well, I, you know, there's actually a lot of songs. Every, every, songwriter, every songwriter from every generation has captured the thought process of this sermon right here. Not in, in this near contemporary uh, music generation building a group called Building 429 come up with a song that says something like this All I know is I'm not home yet 
this is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. They sang it a lot better than I did, but that's the, that's the point of it. This world, this is not where I belong. This is not home. Take this whole world. And as long as I have Jesus, then I can be at peace. And there was a song written way many, many years ago, like in the 50s. <laughs> Said something like, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Why can't I feel at home? Why can't I just be content with this world? Is because it just lasts so long. Amen. But the love of Jesus, the grace of God, lasts forever. God built us to be eternal. Okay. He made sure mankind couldn't partake. Uh, we're going to live eternally one way or the other. He wanted to make sure it wasn't in this life, in this flesh. So he hid from us the tree of life and said, tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and be merciful and let you die. But all you got to do is put your trust in my son, Jesus Christ, then you'll live forever. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? So I'm going to ask you a question here this morning. If you're here today, watching my live stream, whatever the case, and you're not saved. Wow, what a time to do it. Are you miserable? Do you... Do you think about, do you regularly think about what's going to happen when you die? Is there fear in you about what's going to happen when you die? I would venture to say if you'll stop, most people just try not to think about it. Oh, I just don't want to think about that. Stay busy and just try not to think about it. Well, listen, you, you really need to think about it. Right? Put it, put it to the forefront. Just, let's deal with it. Why not, why not be saved? Why not put all your faith in Christ and know that one day when you die, you don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to ask everybody to stand at their feet this morning. If, if God's dealing with your heart this morning, throughout this message, here's the heart of salvation. I said it once and I'm going to, I'm going to say it again. I'm not, I'm not going to do a repeat repeat after me prayer. I'm going to just tell you this. Here's what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for all of us to repent from our sins. Repent of your sins. Lord, I have sinned against you. I know that. And I'm sorry for all the sins that I've committed. We look to Jesus at the cross. We put our trust. We believe and know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on that cross for my sins because he loved me. It's just a matter of saying, Lord, I receive that gift. Salvation is the gift of God of eternal life. I'm sorry for my sins, Lord, and I accept your gift. I accept your offer of grace. I accept your forgiveness. And I invite you just to come and fill me. Let your spirit fill my heart. Change me, mold me, make me into the person that you need me to be. And if God is, I'm not, I'm not going to give a big, long, I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to give a lot, big, long, elaborate altar call. I just, I don't even read where Jesus did that much. He made... He made his grace available, and people either accepted it or they didn't. Today, boy, I encourage you to accept it. To sing the song of invitation, I want to give everybody just an opportunity to just, to just pray on your own. Altars are open. I'd love for you to come to the altar. We'll pray with you. We'll help lead you through this. But where you're standing, especially everybody, I want everybody, obviously, pray for your own heart. If you're, if you're saved this morning, you're a Christian. Ask, maybe ask God, humble yourself and ask God to let this world have less of a hold on you. Amen. I think we can all be honest. I'll be the first one to be honest. Sometimes this world just gets a little bit too much of a hold on me. Sometimes I can get distracted and get a little bit too focused on temporary things. So just be honest. God, help me, help me to stay focused on treasures in heaven. Okay, so pray for yourself. Pray for others that don't know Jesus. But if you're here today and you're not saved, but God's dealing with your heart, you know what I mean. If God's dealing with your heart, you know exactly what I'm talking about right now. You feel this conviction in your heart for your sins and God's dealing with your heart, then I want you to pray what I just prayed a minute ago. Reach out to him. Lord, save me. Please save me. I'm tired of living for this world. I'm tired of the disappointment. I want to know that I'm right with you. Amen. As they sing, pray. Hallelujah.